Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where we focus on the people part of your business. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. My guest today, Ross Shellman, is the CEO of Target Data, a fast-growing data and technology company based in Chicago. Now, he's got a fascinating background, including buying a bunch of franchises, which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. And then he started Target Data in 2011. It is scaled now to over 40 people, and uh, including some recent investors getting involved. And so over the next 20 minutes, we're going to talk about how he's done it, how he's building it, and the team. So with all that, Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Excited to be here today. Likewise. So, well, let's start with just the obvious question, Target Data. What is the business and, and the service? And then we can kind of get into the team part. Yeah, for sure. So the thing about Target Data is a convergence of advertising and technology. So our core mission is to help our clients leverage the power of their customer data and what we refer to as third-party data, which is you know, probably a very hot topic these days of you know, the, the massive amounts of data that, it, that exists in the ecosystem to basically give them the ability to leverage the power of their own data to be highly targeted and efficient in their advertising. And so we're using a lot of technology and data to actually execute media on behalf of our clients, the same way an agency uh, we would do that. Everything that we do is just hyper-targeted to specific people with specific intent and uh, is very mathematical and uh, analytically driven. And just so I'm clear, you're talking about um, using their data, not your data. So are you, are you selling data or does target data take my company's data and, and use it in a, in a unique way? Yeah, it's the latter. So the first thing that we do with every single one of our clients is we've built a technology infrastructure that makes it very efficient for us to ingest and, and then apply you know, a sophisticated amount of analytics um, on their own data. Got it. So Got it. Using a really brief example, if it's a retailer, we're bringing in every single customer that's ever purchased from them, um, all of the transactions. Mm -hmm. and we're using that as the base layer to then apply third-party data um, to really provide deep insights into who are their best customers, what do they look like, where do they live, um, and then ultimately, how do you go find more that look just like them? Got it. So it's a data targeting business more than a software company. You're not really selling software. Yeah. I mean, technically, we're tech-enabled services. I mean, Got it. We get paid yep. to place... And, and, and run media. The data and the analytics and the technology is the way that we arrive at who Got it, got it, got it. And you mentioned, you mentioned retail. Is that your core uh, sector or are there other types of companies that engage you to do this? Yeah, I think that the way to think about it is the, the term that's thrown around in our industry these days is people-based marketing. And, and in order to understand um, and do what we do, we need a direct path to the consumer. Yep. So the example that I always use is we're, we're never gonna do work for um, a makeup company that's selling makeup through Nordstrom. They don't know who's buying their makeup. Yep. Uh, for us, it's retail. We do a lot in home services, um, financial services. Um, we have a really interesting vertical you know, that, that, that um, a lot of people don't think of. We do a lot in uh, museums and tourist attractions. Yep. Um, you know, there's a direct path to the consumer who's buying a ticket, et cetera. Got it. Okay. Very good. So now let's shift to the, uh, the people part of the business, which is kind of the purpose of the show. Sure. Um, tell us kind of, you, you've scaled to 40 people. What are the bulk of these folks in data? Are they AI people? Are they data warehousing people? Are they developers or are they just advertising people that are, that are doing the targeting itself? I'd say the majority of our people are evenly split between client service mm -hmm. and the data science and technology side. And as you've built this team, what's been some of the hard, hardest parts of finding the right people? Yeah, I mean, I'll take both the, let's take both disciplines. They're, they're very different um, yeah. as far as some 
challenges we've had on the people side. But you know, the data analytics side, one of the big lessons that we've learned is that people coming in the door have to have an affinity for the end use of the data. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, we, we've hired some brilliant people that technically had all the right capabilities, could do the work, but weren't really interested in marketing. They wanted to yeah. be data scientists. Yeah, they wanted to play with numbers and, all day. Right. And what the, the, the part that is, you know, it's, it's interesting, and I, I, I make this a very broad statement, you know, about analytics and, and if, if, you're, if you're not taking a portion of why you're doing it and actually understanding and truly caring, it makes it really hard. Yeah. The business application of, the, of data and analytics is you have to think about the business side. It's not just math. Yep. If it was just math, it would all be automated at this point. Yeah. It's applied math, not math. Correct. Right. And so in, that's a fascinating problem. In the hiring process, how have you gone about or how have you learned to go about discerning whether an individual has a genuine interest in that applied math? Well, is this in the interview stage? Is it before or after the interview stage? Is it on their resume? Something that you look for? I think the one thing, I mean, we, we asked them the basic question, I'll believe it. I mean, believe it or not, we never did that before. I mean, it, it sounds silly, but. No, I believe it. I mean, you, 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 a resume comes in the door of, of a, um, you know, someone from the University of Chicago that worked at, you know, you know XYZ company yep. that would all know. And he just, oh, great. They, they yep. have the right skill set. But yep. we, we failed to ask, do you have an affinity for marketing? Yep. Do we sure. really care why you're doing the math? I mean, so that was a really basic um, thing that we started really making sure that we, you know, we did. Um, and I think one of the things that we've done better is certainly, you know, starting from zero to go to here, we've gotten a lot of things wrong on the people side. Um, I, I think we spend a lot of time at all levels of the organization now um, making sure that they meet as many people as possible. And mm -hmm. it's not a formal gauntlet that we put people through, but they're spending time with enough people across the organization that it's pretty easy when we get all the feedback internally, whether or not the person really cares why they're doing the, the, you know, the, the smart stuff, as I like to say, yep. or they want to crunch numbers. And is that more of a formal process where I'll have six interviews or is it more of an informal, Hey, we'll, you know, five of us will take the guy to lunch or gal to lunch and it's come back with their opinion. We want, you know, I'm probably you know, growing and expounding on that point. The relationship between our, our data and analytics folks and our client services people who are actually really the conduit to our clients, that's the piece we have to get right the most. Mm -hmm. And so there is a very formal process of both directions. Someone coming in from a, interviewing a client service is going to spend time kind of cross and cross departmental interviews, making sure that we're looking at this person from both sides because that, that relationship between the two disciplines, which are, are drastically different people. Yep. Still has to work. Yeah. Have you, you've, you've obviously learned this mistake or issue the hard way I'm assuming. And, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, someone came through the process, you hired them only to find out they really wanted to just play with numbers versus kind of the applied math. What did you do? Walk us through how long you gave it. Did you have conversations? And then ultimately what was the outcome? You don't have to name names, but how did you kind of. Oh, of I mean, I, I think, you know, in, in, we've been just setting a little bit of the context. I mean, I, 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 we've had a lot of people come through the organization in, the, you know, the seven years of our existence. And we're pretty good um, in most cases when there's not a fit, quickly figuring that out and, and moving the person along. Does quickly mean hours or days or weeks or months? Um, it, you know, within 60 days, we tend yep. to, and, and we're, I think a lot of early stage companies get this wrong mm -hmm. where they, 
they're, they're afraid to fire. I know that's not terrible. No one wants to fire anyone, but you know, especially in the very early days, the cost associated with not making that decision quickly yep. is so brutal that we, we became very good at making decisions quickly and moving people out the door when they weren't a fit, both for their sake and ours. Yep. Um, but, you know, I, I think in the data, I mean, we're kind of drilling into this one discipline. We, we, this is probably the area that we struggled with the most because of you know, people that had perfect resumes, had all the right technical ability, but couldn't really get you know, the, the job done in certain capacities. We kept giving them probably too many chances. So let's, bro- let's, let's broaden into that issue of you're not hiring a resume, you're hiring a person. Yep. What have you learned, again, maybe the hard way, about how to assess in a way that's actually accurate or actually predictive of how the person's going to do on the job versus they're clearly intelligent, they went to a great school? Yeah. I mean, one, I think it's hard, right? I mean, I, I, it's, it, it's one of these things that you, know, you, you hope you're making the right decision. And, and in some cases, until they're on the job and performing, you don't know. Yep. Um, but I do think that the more time that we spend with someone up front, both in formal and informal um, situations, you know, our, our, our average probably improves. I, you know, I, I certainly think that the ones that we've, that we've hires that we've rushed into yep. have never, I mean, flip a coin. So it's higher, slow, fire fast. Yeah. Which is I mean, cliche, but, but I, you know, it is, it is true. And, and, and also that the, the one thing that, that I, we, we've being very direct about what the role is and what the role isn't. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that we still struggle with, even, you know, we're, we're, we're still in the grand scheme of business, or a, a small organization, describing that, you know, with 40 people, what truly the day-to-day uh, tasks and expectations look like. Because, you know, I think the, the glaring example for early stage companies is you get someone on paper that is you fall in love with because of their ex- expertise and the resume. Yeah. And they came from a fortune 500 company and they truly don't even know yet what it really means to be in a small company. Right. You really spell it out. It's a disaster. Do you shy away from folks who have never worked at a company or size before just because of that degree of risk? I do now. Yeah. Really? I, I used to not. You just don't want to take, you don't want to be the guinea pig. Yeah, and, and, and I find that it's too hard. I mean, you know, probably some of the worst hires we've ever made on paper looked the best and had all, you know, we go into it with tons of expectation and this, you know, and, and truly they just don't know how to operate in a small environment. And, it's, right. and sometimes it's not their fault. Yep. They have never exercised that muscle. They're used to resources, a brand name behind them, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, that's probably one of the, you know, if you were to say what are some of the broadest lessons and, and most crucial lessons along the way, that's probably number one. Especially, I mean, you're young. I mean, in the early days when we, you know, had just a couple clients and we were trying to, you, know, you look upwards and find someone in your industry that is this, that is, has done so many things, but you know, I, I, there was a, a mentor of mine that ha, has, has built and, 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 and sold a bunch of amazing companies. And the best advice that this person gave me after making a few mistakes along this way is when, when in the interview process, don't ask questions about what the company did at the time or you know, what, you know, ask, what did they specifically do as an individual? You know, the example that I would use is, you know, if someone comes in the door and the resume says, I, you know, I was, I was part of the management team that grew the company from making this up 500 million to 800 million in 24 years. Well, what does that mean? What was your specific part in it? What did you do for that? Yes. 
because in a in a you know as as we all know at a large company if, if you're a, holding a management role i mean you, you might not have done anything other than manage the teams that actually did the work to get the company there and in an early stage you need the people that actually did the work sure you might be hiring too heavy a person correct and so have, has that actually happened to you where you hire someone and realize uh, not only were they intelligent, but they were too senior. Yeah, absolutely. What can you do? Can you resize and rescope the situation so that they realize it and fit into the lighter role? Or do you just have to start again? I think in very rare cases, you can right size it. But again, I go back to what I said about most people in that situation don't have the muscle they don't know how to do it. You know, I mean, it's, it's a very different, um, you know, it, it, it's the, the tactical skills needed in some cases just aren't there. Yeah. And then you, you, you've, you've got to start again, which is so painful. Oh, and, and also sometimes, I mean, if it's a senior enough, the strategy that they're putting into place is even more detrimental to the organization. Because what worked in a, in a large enterprise environment as far as you know, exactly you know, how, to, how to move the dial in the organization is very, very different. You know, it's, it's, it, it's, uh, you know, as I like to tell my team all the time, and you know, probably my favorite little saying that probably drives everyone nuts, I mean, you know, we're, not, we're not planning D-Day. We're guerrilla warfare every single day at, at all levels, go blow something up. And you still feel like you're at that point. People who listen would, he, would hear 40 people, they've been at it for seven years. When do, you, when do you get to the point where you start to feel like you've arrived and you can now hire heavier weight people so that you as the founder aren't having to do that heavy lifting? Does that day ever come? Well, it, it, Again, it depends on what discipline. So I've been very fortunate that I've had my my two most senior people, you know, in the organization that are, you know, very senior individuals. They've been with me since the beginning. So the day to day heavy lifting falls on their shoulders on different in, you know, for different parts of the organization. We've been very successful at that piece. I'm talking more, you know, about some of the broader, um, you know, you, you have to stay scrappy, you know. So if you said if you take our organization today and you said where are the places where it, it's all put together, there's lots of process, there's lots of things that are, you know, client service, how we execute, you know, the, you know those those type of things are are very buttoned up, you know, the the, the data piece to what we do. I mean, the, the, you know, the amount of process that we have in the organization and the way that that all comes together mm -hmm. is equal to if we were a hundred million dollar business or more. Incredible. It's more about the, the overarching strategy, sales, marketing, product development, that stuff. I feel like you, know, you, you have to remain scrappy there and a little bit um, hungry for a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that, you, know, you can't get complacent there. You know, I think about some of the things that were game changing for us as far as you know, what, what, what many would probably refer to as product lines or service areas. Right. You know, we're still, we, we're still throwing stuff against the wall and saying, Hmm, the clients want that. Is that something we can do? Does it hold true to our core mission of, you know, being data driven, addressable, if so, let's try it. One last question, Russ. After the interviews, ha have you d added anything in the process aside from the kind of the, the social or informal spending time together to help vet candidates? Or are you relying primarily on interviews? Yeah, I would say at this point, it's per some of it depends on the discipline. You know, we're on the data and the analytics side, 
we're, we're checking pretty heavily on the actual skills, um, making sure that they are truly proficient. It might be a project, might be, you know, something just to demonstrate, you know, anybody in today's world can throw on their resume that they, they're proficient in, you know, X, you know, Python or, you sure. know, right. Sure. sure. But what does that really mean? I mean, we've, we, you know, we, we've uncovered some things along the way about what did you really do with it? So, you know, there's, there's things like that on the client service side. We, we, also put in some practical um, things at the very end, you know, come up with a business problem and come in and pretend we're the client and walk us through how you solved it. Yep. Um, a lot comes out in those practical conversations. Before you make the offer, not after. Don't do it too late in the process. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Well, Ross, this has been fascinating. How can people learn more about target data or get in touch? Yeah, our, our website is, is uh, targetdatacorp.com, uh -huh. probably the best way to, to, to learn more about us. Um, follow us on um, you know, LinkedIn, we, you know, we're putting a decent amount of thought leadership pieces and, and, and some of the, the work that we're doing out there. Um, those are the two main places to, to follow what we're doing. Um, we'd love to hear from people. Great. And thank you again for making the time and sharing all this uh, hard lessons learned with our listeners. Yep. I really appreciate your time and uh, thanks very much.